Good day, and welcome to the Next Era Energy and Next Era Energy Partners LP Second Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchstone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mark Eidelman, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Danielle. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our second quarter 2024 Combined Financial Results Conference Call for NextEra Energy and NextEra Energy Partners. With me this morning are John Ketchum, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of NextEra Energy, Brian Bolster, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of NextEra Energy, Rebecca Chiava, President and Chief Executive Officer of NextEra Energy Resources, and Mark Hickson, Executive Vice President of NextEra Energy, all of whom are also officers of NextEra Energy Partners, as well as Armando Pimentel, President and Chief Executive Officer of Florida Power and Light Company. John will start with opening remarks, and then Brian will provide an overview of our results. Our executive team will then be available to answer your questions. We will be making forward-looking statements during this call based on current expectations and assumptions, which are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results could differ materially from our forward-looking statements if any of our key assumptions are incorrect or because of other factors discussed in today's earnings news release and the comments made during this conference call in the risk factors section of the company presentation or in our latest reports and filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, each of which can be found on our websites, www.nextairenergy.com and www.nextairenergypartners.com. We do not undertake any duty to update any forward-looking statements. Today's presentation also includes references to non-GAAP financial measures. You should refer to the information contained in the slides accompanying today's presentation for definitional information and reconciliations of historical non-GAAP measures to the closest GAAP financial measure. With that, I'll turn the call over to John. Thanks, Mark, and good morning, everyone. NextEra Energy delivered strong second quarter results with adjusted earnings per share increasing more than 9% year over year. In addition, through the first six months of the year, our adjusted earnings per share has increased 9.4% year over year. The continued strong financial and operational performance at both FPL and Energy Resources position our company well to meet its overall objectives for the year. At FPL, we have continued to deliver for our customers on multiple fronts since the start of our most recent rate settlement in 2022. We are making smart capital investments in low-cost solar generation and battery storage, which are continuing to reduce our overall fuel cost, and combined with generation modernizations, have saved customers nearly $16 billion since 2001. We are delivering best-in-class non-fuel O&M, where we're 70% better than the national average, saving our customers $3 billion every year compared to the average utility. A big driver of our outperformance has been our team and culture of continuous improvement and productivity. Nowhere is this better demonstrated than through our annual company-wide initiative to reimagine everything that we do, which we call Project Velocity. This year, we identified a record $460 million dollars of run rate cost savings opportunities through 2027, part of which benefit FPL and its customers. By finding opportunities to take cost out of the business and making smart capital investments to reduce its fuel costs, FPL has kept residential bills nearly 40% below the national average and by far the lowest among all of the Florida investor-owned utilities. FPL's reliability also ranks among the best in the industry, where we are 66% better than the national average, and the number of minutes a customer's power is interrupted per year. I'm most proud of the fact we continue to deliver on our customer value proposition during a period of unprecedented growth in Florida. 
Florida continues to be one of the fastest growing states in the U.S., with roughly 1,000 people moving to Florida every day. And it's not just the residential sector. We're seeing the commercial and industrial sector growing too. As a result of this accelerated growth, FPL's regulatory capital employed has grown at a 12% compound annual growth rate since the beginning of 2022, compared against an estimated 9% compound annual growth rate that was originally anticipated for the four-year settlement period. We have shouldered this additional growth through our reserve amortization mechanism, which enable, enables FPL to absorb the cost for these capital investments without increasing customer bills in the interim. While these efforts have helped us to meet customer growth and deliver for our Florida customers, our reserve amortization mechanism has been utilized faster than expected. FPL fully expects to seek recovery of these increased expenditures in its rate case filing next year. FPL ended the second quarter with a remaining reserve amortization balance of $586 million, which is expected to be sufficient to support FPL's capital investment plans and its ability to earn an 11.4% regulatory ROE this year and next. An 11.4% regulatory ROE is expected to have a $0.06 cent EPS impact in each of 2024 and 2025, which has already been taken into account in our financial expectations, and we will be disappointed if we are unable to deliver financial results at or near the top of our adjusted earnings per share expectation ranges each year through 2027 at NextEra Energy. We expect to continue to demonstrate the benefits and protections that the reserve amortization mechanism provides customers when we file our rate case next year. Our vision is for FPL to be the best utility franchise in the country by doubling down on what we do best, delivering low bills and high reliability for our customers by making smart capital investments and being an industry leader on costs. These attributes are important to our customers and regulators, and they are important to us. We look forward to continuing to deliver on what we believe is an outstanding customer value proposition at FPL. Growth is not only occurring inside Florida, but outside Florida as well. At Energy Resources, we are benefiting from two types of demand, replacement cycle and growth cycle demand. With regard to the former, we have long been a beneficiary of a replacement cycle where higher cost, less efficient generation has been retired in favor of low cost renewables and battery storage. We expect this to continue. And while replacement cycle demand has been around for a long time, growth cycle demand is new. With the exception of a few states such as Florida, power demand from new growth has been static in our industry for decades. That's changing as power demand is projected to grow four times faster over the next two decades compared to the prior two. That growth is being driven by demand across multiple sectors, which is expected to create a long-term opportunity for fast-to-deploy, low-cost generation. As we highlighted at our investor conference, we expect the demand for new renewables to triple over the next seven years versus the prior seven, to help meet this increased power demand. Energy resources couldn't be better positioned as it has a 300 gigawatt pipeline, half of which is in the interconnection queue process or is already interconnection ready. Our scale, experience, and technology, coupled with our ability to build new transmission where required, enable us to meet the growing demands of our power and commercial and industrial customer base. Underpinning these competitive advantages are our decades of data, analytical capabilities, and experience with system operators and relationships with utilities that position us well to get the power to where it needs to go. Our continued ability to drive origination results speaks for itself. Energy Resources added over 3,000 megawatts of new renewables and storage projects to the backlog this quarter, 860 megawatts of which 
come from agreements with Google to meet their data center power demand. This marks our second best origination quarter ever. These results support our belief that the bulk of the growth demand will be met by a combination of new renewables and battery storage. The importance of renewables and storage to help meet our economy's growing demand for power has never been more evident. As data center growth accelerates to facilitate our economy's shift to artificial intelligence, and as we continue to redomesticate and electrify across multiple sectors, our nation must embrace an all of the above strategy to meet increasing electric demand. Renewables and storage are energy independent as they rely on American wind and sunshine. They also are extremely fast to deploy compared to alternative forms of generation, making them vital to our country's success going forward. And importantly, the country has stood up a significant domestic industry to support their growth, which is driving investment in factories and is creating good paying jobs and a tax base that is revitalizing rural communities across America. As customers increasingly demand smart, clean energy solutions, we are the company with experience in every part of the energy value chain and are uniquely positioned to help them make the right decisions for their business. As the owner and operator of a large natural gas fired fleet in Florida, we are also conscious of the importance of natural gas fired generation as a bridge fuel. Yet, we also are well aware of the realities of new build gas fire generation. It's more expensive in most states, is subject to fuel price volatility, and takes considerable time to deploy given the need to get gas delivered to the generating unit and the three to four year waiting period for gas turbines. Low cost, fast to deploy renewables help keep power prices down, making our economy more competitive globally. Ultimately, our country needs all forms of energy as we move forward, and the future has never been brighter for the power generation sector as a whole and renewables in particular. As I've been saying, Next Era Energy was built for this moment, and our future outlook has never been stronger. Our strategic focus is to deliver low cost, clean energy and storage for our customers, both inside and outside Florida while building new transmission where required to support new generation. We have the playbook and the platform to win in any environment, and most importantly, we have the team. Our competitive advantages continue to grow every day, providing industry differentiation that is over two decades in the making and difficult to replicate. And I firmly believe we will continue to expand that strategic distance creating value for customers and shareholders. Nobody is better positioned to meet the demands of the energy customer of tomorrow than Next Era Energy, and I wouldn't trade our opportunity set with anyone. With that, I will turn the call over to Brian to cover the detailed results beginning with FPL. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. For the second quarter of 2024, FPL increased earnings per share by three cents year over year. The principal driver of this performance was FPL's regulatory capital employed growth of approximately 10.7% year over year. We continue to expect FPL to realize roughly 10% average annual growth in regulatory capital employed over our current rate agreements four year term, which runs through 2025. FPL's capital expenditures were approximately $2.1 billion for the quarter. And we expect FPL's full year 2024 capital investments to be between eight and $8.8 billion. Over the current four-year settlement agreement, we expect FPL's capital investments to exceed $34 billion. FPL's second quarter retail sales increased 3.7% from the prior year comparable period due to warmer weather, which had a positive year-over-year impact on usage per customer of approximately 2.6%. As a result, FPL grew retail sales in the second quarter by roughly 1.1% on a weather-normalized basis. For the 12 months ending June 2024, FPL's reported ROE for regulatory purposes will be approximately 11.8%. And the 11.4% regulatory ROE mentioned previously is expected to be realized in the fourth quarter 
for the 12 months ending December 2024. Now, let's turn to Energy Resources, which reported adjusted earnings growth of approximately 10.8% per year at 10.8% year over year. At Energy Resources, adjusted earnings per share increased by 3 cents year over year. Contributions from new investments increased 12 cents per share year over year, primarily driven by continued growth in our renewables portfolio. Our existing clean energy portfolio increased 6 cents per share primarily reflecting an increase in wind resources during the quarter. Wind resource for the second quarter of 2024 was approximately 104% of the long-term average versus 88% in the second quarter of 2023. The comparative contribution from our customer supply business, which you will recall had strong earnings last year, decreased by three cents per share. Contributions from our gas infrastructure business decreased by seven cents per share due to a combination of higher depletion expense related to lower production estimates, certain non-recurring items, and the sale of the Texas pipelines by NextEra Energy Partners. While we may see a few pennies impact again next quarter, we expect gas infrastructure's earnings growth to be effectively flat going forward as we continue to allocate more capital on a relative basis to renewables, storage, and transmission. Similar to what we saw this quarter, The increased contributions from new investment driven by the strength of our renewable development program are expected to more than offset any slowing in gas infrastructure growth going forward. All other impacts reduce earnings by five cents per share. Energy Resources had a strong quarter of new renewables and storage origination, adding 3,000 megawatts to the backlog. With these additions, our backlog now totals roughly 22.6 gigawatts after taking into account more than 1,600 megawatts of new projects placed in the service since our last earnings call, providing great visibility into energy resources' ability to deliver on our development program expectations, which we recently extended at our investor conference. We expect the backlog additions will go into service over the next few years and into 2028. Energy resources' 300 gigawatt pipeline is years in the making and ready to respond to customer demand. We have competitive advantages understanding transmission and grid constraints. We have strong relationships with utilities serving the growing power grid. We can build system solutions across stakeholders and customer needs, and we can leverage our proprietary technology to site and deploy the best projects for our customers. A great example is our collaboration with Entergy where we are targeted to build 4.5 gigawatts of renewable storage solutions to help them meet both their new increased load demand and energy transition goals. And we couldn't be more excited to work with a long-term established customer in order to help them execute on these goals. Another example is our collaboration with Google. As John said earlier, this this quarter's backlog additions include 860 megawatts signed with Google to support their data center needs. That brings our total renewables portfolio with technology and data center customers, including assets in operation and in backlog, to 7 gigawatts. Our competitive position is even further advantaged by our existing portfolio. With interconnection timelines for new sites stretching for three to seven years or beyond, we can dramatically improve our speed to market by utilizing the existing interconnection from our operating footprint to deploy co-located solar and storage as well as execute on wind and and potentially solar repowers. This optionality provides a unique resource to meet our customer needs, while also capitalizing on the embedded option value from the existing portfolio. Beyond renewables and storage, we're excited to say that Mountain Valley Pipeline is now in service. Turning now to second quarter 2024 consolidated results, adjusted earnings from corporate and other increased by two cents per share year over year. During the quarter, NextEra issued $2 billion of equity units, and recently, Energy Resources entered into an agreement with Blackstone to sell a partial interest in a portfolio of wind and solar projects for approximately $900 million. Our long-term financial expectations, which we extended last month at our investor conference, remain unchanged. We will be disappointed if we're not able to deliver financial results at or near the top end of our adjusted EPS expectations range in 2024, 2025, 2026, and 2027. From 2023 to 2027, we continue to expect that our average annual growth in operating cash flow will be at or above our adjusted EPS compound annual growth rate range. 
and we also continue to expect to grow our dividends per share at roughly 10% per year through at least 2026 off a 2024 base. As always, our expectations assume our caveats. Turning next to NextEra Energy Partners, yesterday NextEra Energy Partners Board declared a quarterly distribution of 90.5 cents per common unit or $3.62 per common unit on an annualized basis, up approximately 6% from a year earlier. Turning to the balance sheet, since our last earnings call, the partnership completed the next NEP Renewables II equity buyout of roughly $190 million in June 2024 and paid down our 2024 convertible maturity with cash on hand. After repayment of a $700 million hold code debt maturity earlier this month, the partnership now has approximately $2.7 billion of liquidity. Let me now turn to the detailed results. Second quarter adjusted EBITDA was $560 million and cash available for distribution was $220 million. New projects, which primarily reflect contributions from approximately 780 net megawatts of new assets that either closed in the second quarter of 2023 or achieved commercial operations in 2023, contributed approximately $39 million of adjusted EBITDA and $9 million of cash available for distribution. Second quarter adjusted EBITDA contribution from existing projects grew by approximately $62 million year over year, driven primarily by favorable wind resource during the quarter and partially offset by lower solar generation. Wind resource was approximately 103% of the long-term average versus 88% in the second quarter of 2023. Finally, adjusted EBITDA and cash available for distribution declined by approximately $46 million and $43 million respectively from the divestiture of the the Texas pipeline portfolio, which is partially offset by the interest benefit of the remaining cash proceeds received from the sale of these assets. From a base of our fourth quarter 2023 distribution per common unit at an annualized rate of $3.52, the partnership continues to see 5 to 8% growth per year in LP distributions per unit with a current target of 6% growth per year as being a reasonable range of expectations through at least 2026. Next Air Energy Partners expects the partnership payout ratio to be in the mid to high 90s through 2026. We expect the annualized rate of the fourth quarter 2024 distribution that is payable in February 2025 to be $3.73 per common unit. In terms of next steps for Next Era Energy Partners, as we have discussed with you previously, The partnership is continuing to look at all options to secure a competitive cost of capital and to address the remaining convertible equity portfolio financing buyouts. At the same time, the partnership's 6% distribution growth target remains for now. Next Era Energy Partners does not need an acquisition of related financing in 2024 to meet its 6% target and does not need growth equity until 2027. Next Era Energy Partners owns a large portfolio of high-quality, long-term contracted clean energy assets, and the partnership has attractive organic growth from the repowering of its existing portfolio. We expect to share more in the coming quarters as we address these objectives. Next Era Energy Partners expects run rate contributions for adjusted EBITDA and cash available for distribution from its forecasted portfolio at December 31, 2024, to be in the ranges of $1.9 to $2.1 billion and 730 to $820 million, respectively. As a reminder, year-end 2024 run rate projections reflect calendar year 2025 contributions from the forecasted portfolio at year-end 2024. As a further reminder, our expectations are subject to our caveats. That concludes our prepared remarks, and with that, we'll open the line for questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star, then two. The first question comes from Steve Fleshman from Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Yeah, excuse me. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, Steve, we can okay. hear you. Okay, hey. Um, just uh, 
just first on the comments on the uh, kind of update on the reserve amortization and earned ROE, could you just uh, go back through that again, John, in terms of just the uh, what's driven the increased usage? Is it just that you've ramped up capital a lot quicker than initially planned, or just maybe give a little bit of color on a little more color on that that comment? Yeah, no, a- absolutely, Steve. So, you know, we've had a lot of population growth um, in Florida. A lot of that has impacted our service territory. When we first entered into the settlement agreement uh, back in 21, we thought our regulatory capital employee to be around 9%. It's actually been around 12 of, as we have accommodated uh, that growth. And so we've got surplus that's right around – $586 million um, today as we look forward for um, this year and next uh, based on where we are, the capital plans that we have for the FPL business, which are still very strong to take into account the further growth that we see. Um, we believe that with that amortization balance and those CapEx plans, we'll probably be you know, right around you know, an 11.4% uh, ROE for the full year 24 and for the full year 25. And that has about a six cent impact here this year and a six cent impact next year. It's already folded into our financial expectations and uh, not, not a concern in, in terms of our ability to cover it. And, you know, a big, a, a big plus from this, Steve, is it really, uh, you know, I think is, is a good fact heading into a rate filing in 25 because it demonstrates uh, how the surplus mechanism can really help customers. And the last point that I'll make is don't forget these additional capital investments that we've made, we would expect to see full recovery of in our in our next filing. So this Remember that the surplus mechanism is intended really just to deal with the regulatory lag uh, as we make new investments at FPL to accommodate the additional growth. So we're not worried about this. This is something that um, uh, is is uh, is something that we feel very comfortable about uh, addressing in our financial expectations and doesn't doesn't impact um, where we feel like we will end up uh, this year and next. Okay. Thanks. And then on the this, the Blackstone financing that you mentioned, the nine hundred million. Any information on just the the you know size of the portfolio that was sold and or the stake in that portfolio? Yeah, it, it was a one point six uh, gigawatt portfolio, just a you know mix of renewable assets. And I think the real positive takeaway here for uh, investors is. There's a real demand uh, uh, for next era assets. I mean, we are recognized in the private equity market as being, you know, really the top developer. And given all the growth, and you know, this quarter is a great example of the three gigawatts that we were able to do. Um, you know, we we have a strong trajectory going forward. And as private equity, uh, you know, has opportunities to work with us, and we have a long history of working with private equity. Uh, going back the last, you know, five or six years, um, you know, it, it really is a, a good potential, you know, win-win for, for us uh, and for them. And with the Blackstone organization, you know, we really like the capability uh, that they bring to the table. And there's a lot of crossover uh, between our two organizations in terms uh, of what we do. And so, uh, you know, this was a good fit for us. And the just the, is is what's the percent is the percent stake a piece of the one point six or their their stake is one point six? Yeah, uh, they they invested capital alongside us, and so they, they have a partial interest in that portfolio of one point six gigawatts. And and then last question, just on the recent issue, I, I know you're not doing offshore wind, but just this recent issue with the. Uh, G turbines, uh, turbine uh, at Vineyard Wind, and I know there was a lawsuit filed by AAP. Can you just maybe talk to your turbine performance with them and just are, are you seeing any issues and how you're feeling about that? 
Yeah, for us, I mean, look, you know, first I'll start with the fact that we are, you know, a top decile operator uh, of wind, you know, I think really recognized as the best operator of wind uh, in, in, in the business. And we have a real partnership uh, with GE. And so, uh, you know, look, wind turbines have moving parts, they'll have issues from time to time. But uh, our partnership with GE runs 20 years. And so, you know, we've really never had any issues in, in getting things fixed. And uh, we're always able to structure win-win um, uh, arrangements with them. So as any problems arise through the portfolio, uh, they've always been well managed and addressed in a, in a conciliatory way uh, with GE and uh, uh, the future. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question comes from Shar Pereza of Google. Guggenheim Partners. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning. How are you, Shark? Good. All good. Um, so just real quick, I want to start on NEP. I mean, obviously, um, you guys have the standard language around continuing to evaluate all options. I mean, Brian obviously reiterated the current Kager, but also used the word for now, quote, unquote, which is somewhat new language, believe it or not. Um, can we get a sense on timing what range of options you're thinking about, and I guess how confident are you we can get something done at favorable pricing before the dividend goes under some level of pressure in 27? Thanks. Yeah, hey, thanks, Char. You know, obviously, uh, NEP is getting a lot of our attention in terms of, you know, um, looking at what the alternatives are to both improve the cost of capital, um, which really requires us to, to be able to successfully address the back-end SEPFs. And, you know, as we said in the prepared remarks, all options are on the table. And, you know, what we really um, are, are spending time on, and we're looking at, you know, various solutions around this is, you know, ha how do you tackle those back-end SEPFs in a constructive way that makes sense, uh, you know, in terms of the cost of capital that would be required to, to do that? And then, and then how do we uh, put NEP in a better position uh, for success uh, going forward. So as part of that, you know, we are obviously exploring uh, all alternatives. So we've mentioned private capital as, you know, one potential avenue there uh, as well. The good thing is that, you know, we have time. We have time in 2024. Um, you know, we've said to the market we don't have to do uh, anything. We don't have any drops planned for 24. Uh, don't have uh, growth equity needs in, in, until 27. And so, um, you know, we are we are being thoughtful about our approach uh, around NEP. Got it. And I think Brian, just to not to, to take words out of his mouth, but mentioned in the next couple of quarters, is that is this something maybe we'll get to some sort of a definitive direction yeah. this year? Yeah, sure. I don't want to put a firm deadline on it, but but you know, I think the language we use is over the next few quarters, and you know, once we have. Um, identified a solution that that we think makes sense, then you know obviously we will share that, but but not until then. Okay, perfect. And then just on near, obviously, just congrats on a you know very strong registration quarter. It was definitely on the higher end. Google was a key contributor. I guess do your sort of existing contract protections and supply chain maybe strategy allow to kind of navigate some of the challenges in this space as you're continuing to expand development to maybe much higher levels, right? So can supply chain, kind of these bottlenecks that we've seen, become a governor around backlog additions as we look through 25 and beyond, especially as you're trying to meet the needs of these large energy-intensive customers, right, like the hyperscalers? Thanks. Yeah, good question, Char. So the, here's how I think about supply chain. You know, number one, there's been a, you know some attention around the ADCV filing and tariffs and those things. Um, we're not impacted, and you know I ma made the the comment, and we spent a lot of time at this both in March and then at our uh, investor conference in June. Still matters more than ever in this business. So the way I would think about it from an investor perspective is, you know. The bigger our program, the more leverage we have over our supplier. And um, in the last couple of years, we have really um, spent a lot of time and made investment around the data and analytical capability that we have around our supply chain. And we have also 
made a very conscientious effort around risk transfer and making sure that we have adequate security to provide incentive to perform. So we um, we are in a position where, you know, we have really been able to transfer, you know, any tear for ADCVD or related risks, you know, over to our suppliers. And why is that? The, the reason for that is when you're, uh, you know, put numbers up like three gigawatts a quarter uh, and have the type of build that we have and expect to have going forward, uh, OEM contractors want contractors and vendors want to work with us. And they've also seen a lot of smaller developers that ultimately haven't been able to arrange financing or for whatever reason haven't had terrific follow through on their projects. That's not the case with, with our company. And so there's been even a greater emphasis, I would say, uh, by our suppliers to want to work with us more than ever. But but what that means is making sure that um, we are always left in a position where we are not taking taking um, uh, risks um, around the obvious things that, that you might put on your list. And so I really feel better than ever uh, about where we stand uh, from a supply chain perspective and and very happy with the job that, that our team has done and uh, the lessons that we've learned over the last couple of years have all been folded into uh, how we contractually uh, approach risk in our agreements going forward. Terrific. Thank you guys so much. Congrats, and uh, we'll see you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, Shark. The next question comes from Julian Dumoulin-Smith from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much, team. Appreciate it. Absolutely, Julian. Good to hear you. Hey, pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Can you speak to how you're thinking about asset recycling here? I mean, I'm, I'm curious specifically on the latest portfolio sell-down, right, with Blackstone, as mentioned earlier, but um, how do you think about other assets here? As you think about, like, for instance, some of these headlines on transmission or gas infra as being in focus, it's notable after the FCG sale last year. How do you think about, you know, continued monetization of, of, of renewable assets or portfolios relative to sort of the ongoing streamlining and focusing back to the core renewables business, if you will? And then related, how do you think about that 70-30 mix as you pair back, um, you know, as you pair these different asset sales through the, the forecast period? Yeah, no, uh, good question, Julian. So uh, from a recycling standpoint, I feel better than, than, I, than I ever have in terms of the options um, uh, that, that we have going forward for the portfolio. In terms of asset mix and, and how we think about that, uh, obviously, you know, we've always had a history of being able to recycle capital uh, around renewables, which are terrific assets, which, you know, I think we have a great reputation in the market around in our ability to um, attract capital um, on the renewable portfolio. But look, you know, we are also making a conscientious effort. I think I made these comments at the investor conference that um, we're looking at uh, our core business, right? Our core business is wind, it's solar, it's battery storage, it's transmission, both inside Florida, outside of Florida. And so to the extent we can do um, some targeted uh, capital recycling around our gas infrastructure business. Uh, that will continue to be type of top of mind. Uh, transmission uh, you raised as well. Um, we are having a lot of success in transmission. And, you know, the team has done a terrific job, I think, on, to, on the competitive transmission side of identifying new opportunities. And just based on the return structure that we could target, there's there's good sense to bring in a partner on some of those deals. And so those have been um, opportunities that we have been targeting uh, as well as we think about the future. But obviously, it puts us in a position where, you know, we continue to manage those assets and those opportunities uh, as, as we think about, uh, you know, how they contribute to the future. But, uh, you know, those certainly are two things that we look at in addition to uh, the renewable portfolio. And the numbers that we gave uh, at the investor conference, you know, uh, I, I certainly don't lose uh, any sleep over uh, in terms of the ability to, to meet those capital, re capital recycling targets. From a business mix perspective, I think, which was your last question, you, you know, um, uh, and I think most folks on the phone know that we are very rigorous about looking at our um, five-year forecast and, and, and even go beyond that. And so we're constantly looking at um, our mix and what our obligations are and undertakings are um, with the agencies. And 
we have a lot of headroom, a lot of headroom on our business mix. So that is not an issue. That is not a concern. And the capital recycling plan, I think, fits well with um, what's what what our undertakings are are there. But uh, plenty of headroom on business mix. Excellent. And just clarification on the last question. Um, just with respect to getting that three gigawatt uh, milestone uh, for the quarter here in terms of booking, is that kind of a good new run rate here? Or again, given the size of these new um, counterparties, is it going to be fairly lumpy moving up and down quarter to quarter here? Just trying to set um, a little bit of an expectation there. Absolutely. I'm going to turn that one over to Rebecca. Good morning, Julian. Um, it, we couldn't be more excited um, about the origination, uh, not only that we've been able to produce over the last couple of years, uh, each of them being a record in their own right, and then the first two quarters being uh, each of them, the ironically, the, the second best quarter, um, obviously this quarter topping last quarter that we've ever had. Um, I, I'll caveat it that, you know, origination can be a little bit lumpy. Um, I've consistently said that in quarters where it's a little bit lower uh, than where we are today, and I, I think I even said it the day that we uh, that we set the, the top quarterly um, additions, um, you know, a couple of quarters ago. Um, so there's always a little bit of bumpiness in the uh, in there, but uh, what we continue to see is consistent with the comments uh, that we all made at the investor conference just last month. Uh, that and, and John talked about in his opening remarks today that the combination of the replacement cycle and the growth cycle is a tremendously positive outlook for us over the very long term. Um, some of this is going to take a little bit longer to materialize on the growth side, uh, as we also highlighted last month. Um, and so you'll see some of those, you know, the stronger additions of the three gigawatts that we added to our backlog, um, particularly notably strong in, in years 26 and 27, uh, and even some megawatts added to 28 and beyond. But overall, what we see today and the execution of our team and the value proposition that we bring to our customers is a very bright outlook. Excellent. Congrats, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. The next question comes from Nick Campanella from Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, team. Thanks for all the information today. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Shar's comments. You know, you talked about being able to kind of pass through um, some of these higher tariff costs to the extent they kind of materialize. Just there's also a projection for you know two rate cuts this year, and I'm just curious if you can kind of talk about how that changes the returns for near that you com kind of communicated at the analyst day and previous quarters. If you could just update us on that. Sure. Uh, you know, you know, first of all, um, as you know, we, you know, we are uh, always looking to manage risk around our capital investment decisions. And one of those risks is it's not only locking in equipment costs, it's not only locking in labor, uh, but it's also locking in our cost of capital. So, you know, as we approach our renewable portfolio, you know, we've been very mindful of making sure that um, we are locking in our cost of capital through interest rate hedge project, pr products swaps uh, in, in that regard. Um, as I think about the future and, uh, you know, the rate, the, you know, the one, the two rate cuts, you know, who, who knows where we, where we ultimately end up, uh, you know, on, on those fronts. You know, obviously, um, you know, given the financing plans that we have moving forward, you know, those would be tailwinds, you know, for, for the business, but at the same time, if those don't materialize, uh, you know we have already, uh, you know, taken those into account uh, in our in our financial uh, expectations, and we're very uh, prudent and on top of managing the risk, the interest rate risk exposure that we have across the business. Hey, that's helpful. Thanks a lot. And then, you know, John, I think you've been pretty clear about you know the ability to supplement this power demand inflection with new renewables. And, you know, you also have this nuclear portfolio. I understand a lot of that's kind of contracted, but, um, you know, there were headlines about potential Dwayne Arnold restart. I just, I guess, how realistic is that? Is that something you'd even kind of consider at this juncture? And how do we kind of think about the strategic positioning of your nuclear portfolio? Sure. Uh, thanks, Nick, for that question on nuclear. Uh, you know, with regard to uh, Dwayne Arnold, uh, you know, I think there would be opportunities uh, and a lot of demand from the market if we were able to do something with Dwayne Arnold. Obviously, bringing back um, a nuclear plant is uh, into service is not something, uh, you know, that 
that, that you can do without a lot of thought. And, uh, I, you know, it is something that we are looking at, uh, but there is a lot of thought that has to go into it. And, you know, obviously a real assessment, uh, you know, around risks associated with that uh, as well. And so, sure, we're, we're looking at it, but um, we would only do it if, if, you know, we could do it uh, in, in a way that uh, is, is essentially, you know, risk-free with, a, with plenty of mitigants around uh, the approach. And, um, and there, are, you know, there are a few things that, that we would have to, have to work through. But, yes, we are, we are looking at it. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you, Nick. The next question comes from Jeremy Tonnet from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Just wanted to get a little bit more color on the renewables market right now. As, as you've discussed, very strong demand in the market. And just wondering, you know, going back to some of the comments at the analyst day, uh, what trends you see in PPA pricing at this point in, in how, you know, could that potentially benefit NextEra going forward? Thanks, Jeremy. appreciate the, the conversation um, and, and question. Um, you know, we've continued to see very strong returns um, with respect to what we think we need in order to be highly confident that we're adding shareholder value. And I would think about the returns that we laid out. The investor conference is, is almost minimum threshold uh, that we have at this point. Uh, and there are opportunities um, where, you know, there's significant customer demand. We have unique um, positioning in the marketplace uh, to make sure that we get even more attractive returns. I'd say it's a very positive dynamic. Um, you know, it's, it was a, a very difficult market over the last couple of years uh, when we were seeing the supply chain disruption and, and increasing pricing both on the uh, capital equipment side and, um, and the rate side and, and our returns. And fortunately, we've either seen you know, slightly declining um, or at, uh, at a minimum stable uh, backdrop, which is certainly helpful uh, for you know, decreasing our risk and also you know, providing an attractive price and attractive product to, to our customers. So between the attractive price, the speed to market, uh, the clean attribute of renewables and storage, um, as well as the fact, as we talked about last month, you know, in the, the queue across the United States today, uh, all of the projects that are waiting to be connected, 90% uh, of those megawatts are renewables and storage, uh, and we have a healthy, healthy portion of those, uh, and I couldn't be more excited about our position. So I think we're in a great shape to continue to add a lot of shareholder value in the, in the many years ahead. Got it. Sounds good. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. The next question comes from David Arcaro from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Oh, hey, good morning. Thanks so much for taking my questions. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're hearing uh, utilities around the country now that with, with fast-growing pipelines, thousands of megawatts of data center requests. It seems to be moving rapidly, just month by month. Uh, they seem to be learning more, getting more demand. I'm wondering, just do you think that's already in your numbers, you know, in your uh, renewables targets here, or could we potentially see another wave of demand as some of these utilities nail down just how much load is really coming into their service territories? Hi, David. It's Rebecca. Um, I'll chime in here. Um, yeah, we, we certainly are hearing from our power sector customers a lot of interest um, from various data center customers, whether it's the data center operators or the hyperscalers. Um, you know, it is a little bit challenging to see how much of that is uh, you know, potentially multiple requests for the, ultimately the same data center, but there is no escaping the fact that these are very large numbers uh, and things that um, numbers that I don't think any utility across uh, the industry has seen before. And so it's going to take some time not only to, to rationalize that and figure out how you address it, but also to procure and bring online the megawatts and the transmission over the long term that is going to be required to serve this demand if it ends up being as strong as we, as we see it and, and we think it might be. Um, from our perspective, um, consistent with our comments from, from last month, um, you know, we are seeing a lot of interest, both from the um, power sector customers as well as uh, hyperscalers and data center customers. You're clearly seeing some of that show up in our origination, um, but you're also sh seeing some of that, more of that show up in this 26 and 27 time frame, and now even 28, as we are lining up these projects to support when they will come online for 
um, our utility customers. So I think you know, we, we all are very excited. Um, it, is, it is very interesting for our sector to see this growth that we haven't seen in a couple of decades. Um, but I do think from a practical standpoint, it's going to take a couple of years uh, for this really to materialize and the utilities to be able to absorb it and serve it. Uh, but that's a terrific backdrop for us. Um, some of these challenges are going to be difficult to solve, and I believe there's no better company uh, to partner with our customers to help solve them. Yeah, understood. Thanks for that color. Um, and then I was curious on, um, you know, on hyperscaler deals. Is are there any other details you would uh, be able to provide around the Google um, relationship here? Just maybe the the location or timing of when these projects are coming on. Is it a single location or you know multiple uh, locations? Are you embedding wind, solar storage? You know, multiple technologies in terms of what what product maybe makes sense um, for these hyperscaler deals? And then just along those same lines, would you be interested in some kind of a multi-gigawatt, multi-year framework? Is that an idea that you're pursuing um, with, these, with these bigger hyperscaler customers? Sure. Well, David, I'll answer it um, more broadly than, than just specific to, to one customer, um, certainly for a variety of reasons, including sensitivities. Some of these, uh, these comments would otherwise uh, be sent for them for their own competitive positioning. Uh, but these are, those specifically were new contracts, uh, and they were to support data center demand uh, that our customer had. And then more broadly speaking, from, from a hyperscaler's perspective, um, they are interested in a variety of technologies, wind, solar, and battery storage. Um, and they, you know, I would say probably the biggest um, change for many of them is a shift or certainly an increasing percentage of these projects that are very specifically associated uh, with the data centers that these hyperscalers are trying to build. Um, so it's less interest in just a pure virtual power purchase agreement where the project could be anywhere in the U.S. Uh, to I want to make sure these resources are there to support my data centers uh, as they are getting connected to the utilities in those local jurisdictions and, and can come online at the same time. So very much becoming a more physical market uh, and one in which it's really important that their partners show up and perform and deliver as expected. Uh, because they are, you know, the load on the other side of that. Um, so that's a, a very attractive proposition from our perspective. As it relates to the structured agreements, listen, we are most focused on making sure that we add value for these customers. Um, that could come in a variety of different forms and, and factors, uh, but our primary focus is being there and delivering for them when they need us. Um, and, and we'll update you as, as those structures evolve, uh, but it's really focused around creating value with and for them. Great. Very helpful. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. The next question comes from Carly Davenport from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, maybe just to start, you know, a lot has obviously changed in the U.S. election landscape since your last earnings call. So can you just talk us through your latest expectations on potential implications on the IRA and, and what impact any modification to that legislation might have on your renewable development plans? Sure, Carly. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take that. You know, I start with, you know, we've always been able to work with both sides of the aisle in the 22 years that I've been at NextEra, and I, I don't think this time around is any different, and I'm going to kind of go through why. Um, and let's not forget that, you know, in that time, we've invested hundreds of billions of dollars in American energy infrastructure across almost every state in the country who are benefiting from those investments. And, you know, we invest in American energy dominance every single day and are the quintessential all-the-above energy company. And that doesn't change from one election to the next, and I think really helps, you know, when we are working with both sides of the aisle. That said, you know, in, let's look at where the incentive money is going. The incentives favor Republican states, and, you know, we've seen an increase in the number of Republican lawmakers that are embracing the clean energy credits within the IRA as they see the positive impact to their states and communities, which is hard to, to, to turn away from. And, and the tax laws are very difficult to overturn. And we're very likely to have thin margins in the House and the Senate, particularly in light of some of the recent developments. And let's not forget the important role that renewables play, and I made some remarks about that in my, in my script today, but renewables create jobs, they create a property tax base that transforms rural communities, 
renewables are energy independence. Um, it's electricity generated from the sun and the wind. It's not subject to fuel price volatility. Low cost renewables are, you know, are also bringing power bills down, which attract new investment from data centers, semiconductor chip manufacturers, and other sectors that are looking to invest in the U.S. And low power bills can really dictate which states they select to make those investments in. And tariffs are going to further drive investment in the U.S. And with industrial growth across sectors, some of that driven by tariffs, power demand is only going to go up from here. And our country is going to need low-cost, fast-to-deploy electricity more than ever. And renewables are the quickest to market, and they're the lowest cost option in almost every state. Otherwise, if, you know, we're going to slow down and curtail economic growth in our own country, and the credits all flow directly to customers in the in the form of lower power prices. So, when you when you look at all that, um, you know, why would you cut credits that are creating jobs, creating a much needed property tax base in rural America? that flow to customers that result in lower power prices, that attract new investments, and that provide a much needed fast to deploy resource at a time when demand is accelerated. It just wouldn't make sense. And for all these reasons, we expect the credits to, re to remain in place, the wind, the solar, the battery storage. So all in all, while we, we would expect to hear heated rhetoric through the fall campaign, we feel good about where things stand again. We have a long history of constructive uh, engagement with, with both sides of the aisle. Awesome. Appreciate all of that color. It's really helpful. Um, the follow-up was just uh, just on the backlog. Um, you know, wind saw a bit of an acceleration this quarter from being a bit weaker in the last several. Anything in particular you'd point to in, in sort of driving that, and do you think that's a potential sign of an inflection uh, on, on the wind demand side? Hi, Carly. It's Rebecca. Um, you know, we were very pleased um, to add these um, these projects uh, to the backlog and excited about the the partnership with the customers with whom we're going to uh, to contract them. I wouldn't necessarily draw any additional lines um, as kind of consistent with the prior uh, comments I made around backlog. Things are going to be um, lumpy over time. It's terrific that we were able to add uh, some additional wind projects to the backlog. Um, and uh, right now, our expectations remain consistent with what we laid out uh, last month and obviously have, uh, again, in our presentation materials uh, today in terms of the targets over the next four years. Um, but I did say as part of our comments uh, last month, uh, I am optimistic, hopeful maybe, uh, that as we look back after this four-year period, um, that is potentially the area where we may have been too conservative uh, and, and you know, maybe on the lower side of it. It is early in this cycle uh, to, to make that conclusion, but we strongly believe that wind, solar, uh, and battery storage as complementary technologies uh, and low cost and fast to deploy, as John just highlighted, are immensely valuable to our customers. Um, and so having the availability of all three, um, we think will continue to, to create value uh, for our customer base over a long period of time. Got it. Thanks so much for the, the time and the comments. Thank you, Carly. The next question comes from Andrew Weisel from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a quick one to clarify, please. If I heard you right, I think you said you have seven gigawatts in total with tech and data center customers. Can you just give us a sense of the pace, maybe roughly round numbers, how many megawatts per year you've been adding or expect to add? And then if you could also just clarify, is that purely in terms of wind solar storage, or does that also include transmission? Hi, Andrew, it's Rebecca. Um, so that is just um, projects uh, for with technology companies. Roughly three, grig three gigawatts of those are already in service, and roughly four gigawatts now um, are the ones that are in the backlog that we plan to build over the, over the coming years. It is a mix of technologies, probably trend-wise fairly consistent with what we have seen for overall trends for renewables development. Um, so the projects that are already in service are, are likely to be more heavily weighted towards wind um, as we've entered into those uh, relationships over a longer period of time. Uh, and then in terms of the backlog, for now, they're, they're more weighted towards solar and storage, uh, but I expect that to, to even out over time, particularly as these projects 
get more um, deliberately balanced with new data center demand as, as these hyperscalers and data center operators are starting to put projects in service. So I, I, you know, broadly speaking, roughly consistent with, with overall development trends. Uh, and you know, we certainly are seeing a lot of demand um, both directly with them as well as in you know, kind of these three-way collaborations with the utilities that ultimately will need to serve them uh, as uh, they are and will continue to be adding these new data centers and bringing them on themselves. Okay, great. Do you see much of an opportunity on the transmission side working with data centers, or is your focus more on, on what you were describing? I would say from a transmission perspective, all of this demand, whether it was the historical replacement cycle demand and now you know, further accelerated by the growth demand, um, particularly as it gets uh, served with um, renewables and storage, uh, is, it is incredibly important that new transmission get built uh, in order to be able to get the resources from which they're most optimally generated to where they're most optimally con consumed, and that's changing a little bit. But what's not changing is the need to build transmission. Um, we see interest from the hyperscalers and the data center operators to understand transmission uh, and be supportive of it getting built. Uh, but it is a very technically uh, um, complex and you need to understand transmission uh, and how to interact with the system operators and the transmission owners and operators themselves. So I don't see them necessarily wanting to build transmission, uh, but they are very interested in having us and others uh, ensure that it gets built to support their own long-term objectives. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Durgesh Chopra from Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Uh, hey, team. Good morning. Really, really appreciate uh, you taking the time and answering my question here. Just uh, all my other questions have been answered. Just one quick follow-up on Carly's questions on election and, you know, potential repeal of uh, IRA risks. How much of that, you had a really strong quarter on renewable origination, but how much of that political instability is actually impacting, you know, your ability to sign contracts? Is that, uh, does that come up in your negotiations? Is that keeping your customers away from signing contracts into the future? Any color on that is appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Durgesh, the short answer is, is absolutely not. Um, you know, if if anything, and if they if they really did believe that um, there were going to be modifications that only accelerate demand, which is certainly not something that we you know we believe for the reasons I went through, but um, it's it's not curtailing demand at all. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Durgesh. This concludes our question and answer session, and the conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.